Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's presentation, part of our Agilent Zoe Analysis Global Conference. My name is Justine Ho. I'm the West Coast Field Application Scientist in the Cell Analysis Division at Agilent, and I will be your host for today. Before I introduce our speaker for today, allow me to share a bit about Agilent and our products for cell analysis. Agilent, as a leader in life science, is very focused on enabling our customers to gain insights they seek. Our rapidly growing cell analysis portfolio enables deeper, more reliable insights for investigators to gain confidence in their interpretation through all stages of development, such as in drug target and identification and validation, drug efficacy, mechanism of action, toxicity, safety, and translational research. This is critically important to open new avenues of therapeutic intervention and expand drug discovery pipeline. Our presentation today will speak specifically on how Agilent's technology are being employed in drug discovery. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker who I've gotten to know for many years, Dr. Joy Fenn, Principal Scientist from Gilead Science. Joy will present on the mechanism based off-target screening de-risk clinical development of antiviral nucleoside and nucleotides drugs. This is important research to advance our understanding of therapeutics and antiviral drug development, especially under this current global pandemic. Joy Finn is a principal scientist at Gilead Science she has a PhD in medicinal chemistry from the University of Florida. During her postdoc training at Dr. Karen Anderson's lab at Yale, Joy developed her deep appreciation of mitochondria while studying drug-induced to mitochondrial toxicity using an enzymatic approach. At Gilead, Joy continues to probe drug-induced mitochondrial toxicity in addition to studying mitochondria enzymes, she also used mitochondria protein, cellular respiration, and other parameters to evaluate mitochondria toxicity. She has used these approaches successfully to assess mitochondria liability for multiple approved antiviral agents for HIV, HCV, and most recently COVID-19. But before I hand it over to Joy, I would like to go over a couple of housekeeping notes. There will be a question and answer session immediately following our talk to help us get through as many questions as possible. We encourage you to type the question in during the presentation. Right after the presentation, we invite you to join myself and Joy and other experts in the networking lounge for further discussion. We also would like you to invite you to stop at the poster session if you haven't done so and visit um, uh, some of our experts in the exhibit hall to learn more about what's new at Agilent. With that, I will hand the presentation over to Dr. Joy Fenn. Joy? And it's always lovely to have uh, your friend to open a uh, lecture for you. And today I want to bring everyone to the world of antiviral drug discovery and share the painful lessons we have learned in the past 40 years. And when I say we, actually, I mean the broader sense, a collective of us, uh, not that including the you know, scientists who discover these drugs and the, the clinicians bring them to phase one, two clinical trial, and also the patients. So with this, um, let me go to uh, what I'd like to cover for today is um, the nucleoside analogs. If you haven't heard of this term before, welcome. Um, the, co the topic of cover is what are they? Why they work so well as antivirals? Actually, they are the cornerstones of so many therapies we use to treat, treat multiple viral infections. And what are the adverse effects we see in clinical trials? Um, and why, we'll come to you, why mitochondria are actually one of the off targets. Um, and the, the fourth point is, why it's important to distinguish this mitochondria specific toxicity away from the general toxicity. And what we learned after all these years, can we screen or see this toxicity early on, even before they enter the, the uh, preclinical animal species? And the last, remdesivir, to tie into today's climate is, 
how do we evaluate remdesivir in the screening paradigm? I'll show you in a minute. So now let's, I'm going to share with you what are the nucleoside analogs. So before we go to the analogs, let me share with you what are the natural ones. So what I'm showing you here um, are the structures of, on the left is the deoxycytidine, on the right is ribocytidine. And the only difference is basically the hydroxy group on the two prime of the ribose. And they are the building blocks of our, let me go to the next slide. They are the building blocks, of our DNA and RNA. Um, actually, as early as the 1950s, we have learned to, to interfere or interrupt the, the DNA RNA synthesis to treat cancer. And this compound I show you here actually made big difference in, in the survival rate of leukemia in 1950s. And with time, we learned that um, you can try to make analogs of these natural building blocks and fool the virus to taking them in, taking these analogs uh, to build their DNA RNA. In that sense, you can uh, interrupt with a viral synthesis, a viral replication. On the left, I can, you can show actually if we remove the, the three prime hydroxy group from what I've shown from natural analog, natural nucleotide size, um, we successfully developed commercial drugs uh, to treat herpes simplex, HIV infection, and hepatitis B. By the same principle, you can also look at you can you also you can look at um, develop antivirals against RNA viruses, and that successful lead to successful successful discovery of uh, drugs that can um, treat influenza and hepatitis C. And most recently, the SARS coronavirus 2, which is the, the virus caused COVID 19. On the next slide, I will show you at the molecular level how these nucleoside analogs work. So, in this slide, you can see actually, I give you an example of um, example we're looking at the HIV infected cell. On the left part of the column, on the left part of the slide, you'll see two analogs. So these are all adenosine analogs, and on the top, uh, the TAF is uh, approved for HIV treatment. On the bottom is Tenofovir. Uh, we make, so the difference between these two compounds is just TAF. You see the blue branches hang on the right. These we call prodrugs. So they can mask the charge when brought by the phosphate and make this compound a hundred times more efficient taken in by the cell than Tenofovir itself, which is shown on the bottom. Then once this TAF or tenofovir enters a cell, um, the cell, the hydrolysis present in the cell will remove all the branches. Now you, you see um, TAF, which has a monophosphate on it. And then different phosphotransferases, again, in our cell, will take care of adding one and two phosphates consecutively, consecutively into this molecule. Now we reach to a uh, a stage of the compound we call an active metabolite. So when you talk about nucleoside analogs, actually that species can enter a cell is not the truly active species. You have to reach this stage, which will be used by the viral application. And often you will hear the term I call the um, active metabolite. And what happened from this point on, the viral replication machinery in this particular case is HIV, HIV reverse transcriptase, which is a DNA dependent RNA synthesis, uh, RNA, since RNA polymerase, or can be a DNA dependent DNA polymerase. It will incorporate this analog into its growing DNA chain. But I illustrate on here with the red dots, it can get incorporated, but due to the structure modification, there won't be incoming nucleotide attached to that to allow um, further elongation and that hot um, viral RNA DNA synthesis and that's how it uh, stopped the viral replication. But at the same time, you can imagine in our human cell, um, viral replication won't be the same uh, only thing happening because we also have our own DNA and RNA replication machineries. And the tricky part is make sure we develop a drug that is only used by the viral polymerases and minimally used by our host uh, polymerases. 
and that learn easy to say but very hard to achieve. So on the next few slides, I'll share with you a few case studies of the painful failures we have encountered over the past 40 years. Um, great, gratefully, we learned from this, but let me share with this you. The first one is FIAU. It, this compound showed minimal toxicity in preclinical animal species and showed didn't show any toxin during phase one, and only during phase two that you can see um, one patient developed liver toxicity shock and lactic acidosis. I think for you guys who work with um, cellular respiration, probably hope that would give you some hint. And then there are more patients developed toxicity, so the, the clinical development stopped. Because of this, many groups that work on this try to figure out what the bottom line, what, what's the cause of the, this toxicity, or what is off target for this compound. And um, after many groups work together, we learned that mitochondrial DNA polymerase is a primary off target for this compound. So we start to implement assays to evaluate that, look at, look at the mitochondrial DNA content, look at uh, the incorporation and inhibition of mitochondrial DNA polymerase. So we thought we solved this problem and we can move forward. Uh, but then 20 years later, when we develop HCV antiviral, uh, bear in mind that the first example I showed you earlier, we're treating with a DNA virus. But this one, we are treating RNA virus now. Mm -hmm. And this compound, again, um, in phase two trial, showed severe toxicity in one patient. This time it's not liver toxicity, it's not lactic acid, but it's heart and kidney. And the clinical trial stopped. So we look back and it's kind of baffled to us because the, the lessons we learned from the previous one uh, didn't seem to help us because look at mitochondrial DNA, it didn't seem to touch mitochondrial DNA. But actually the, the following work from my group and that group show that in this particular case, it's mitochondrial RNA polymerase get uh, hit. What I show you is example here, but it's definitely not an isolated case because I want to show you landscape um, once in a while. I mean, when we develop HCV nucleoside analogs. So you can see I have eight compounds here and I'll show you the fate of them. All of them entered uh, phase one. I mean, most of them enter phase two and then Let's see what happened. So only one compound, sulfosbear, sulfosbear, um, get approved as an HCV, and actually it's now it's being used. And the 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 fact we can reach ninety nine percent cure of the HCV patient, really this compound um, act a great role in the combination against a cocktail treatment. But you can see the one in the blue, they are they fail due to um, inefficient uh, PK. But what's shown on the bottom, all the ones circled in red, they fail due to toxicity. And you can see the toxicity are quite diverse from liver toxicity to hematologic, um, to heart, kidney, and GI. So when we look at this different toxicities that um, made us to went back to look at the early HIV antivirals, right? Even though we already know Mitochondria toxicity, mitochondria is the target there, but look at all the plethora of different uh, clinical representations. Heart, you know, neuropathy, deafness, lactic acid doses. So um, at that time, imagine you're in the 1980, early 1990s. Look at this toxicity and say, what is going on? Um, but someone really made a connection here is basically made out to look at, compare the phenomenon we see in nucleoside analog discovery in seeing clinic to the inherited um, mitochondrial disease here. And you can see when you have a mitochondrial mutation or disease, you can see there is a very diverse toxicity, but when you link to the right, it seems to they're connected. Um, actually, I, I think that this is how it led us to the mitochondrial path. Uh, when I talk to toxicologists, I say, you know, um, we have all the ways to monitor toxicity in preclinical species. Why we, um, it's so, it seems so hard. And he, he told me, 
that he would rather work with a compound with general toxicity because he said, I can see them in my preclinical models, preclinical animal models. But when you work with mitochondrial toxicity, it's tough because it takes chronic exposure and the symptom often delayed. Um, and also there's rapid deterioration. You may not see anything to one point, um, there's no point of return. We call that cliff effect. And this been, had been observed by many. So now um, to understand this one, I'd like to bring you to mitochondria to understand what is unique about mitochondria. To this group of people, of course, we don't you remind um, mitochondria is so important in our cell biology. But what's unique about it, it has its own DNA. Um, so the, the DNA also it has its own polymerase, but these polymerase are less efficient, I guess, they're, because they had more relevant to bacterial origin, uh, is less sophisticated in terms of proofreading and recognize the, I guess, the fake nucleosides um, than our regular DNA polymerase replication machinery. And also there's mitochondria has multiple DNA copies. So in a sense, that's where the cliff effect come from, right? In our cell-based assay, we found we can deplete mitochondrial DNA down to 15%, and then the cell still survives. You can see the ATP levels seem to be normal, but you have to reach a certain point, then the, the, the cell collapse. So now look at, now I share with the biology, unique biology of mitochondria. Let's look at what are the conventional ways we look at toxicity for when we develop drug for therapy. Often we have cellular system, we have animal models, and we go to human subject. And hopefully we can stop a drug before it's come to this step. But the cellular system, for a long time, we all use cancer-derived cells and culture in high glucose media. And that kind of just makes the cancer cells probably doesn't need to rely 100% on mitochondria at all because it has sufficient nutrients going on there. And the second one is animal models, because purebred animals may not reflect the diversity in mitochondria. Uh, because many, there is a portion of us population who, who had mitochondria dysfunction, but may not be symptomatic and only to stress the system enough to see this one. So over the years, we learned from the failure or learn from the, the, the hurtful, the harmful or the uh, hurtful Failure we learned, so we developed a system. I've been testing this system over the years. Um, this is our the current screening paradigm for this class of compounds in, in our group. It's basically we use biochemical assay to look at DNA on a polymerases and see whether this nucleus analog touch them. Second one, we look at the cellular level, and we use two types of cells, both the primary cells and immobilized cells, and we can learn different information from them. And lastly, we go to the mitochondria level, look at um, the DNA depletion, the particular mitochondrial protein expression, and lastly, look at the functional assay, respiration. So now I'll go to each one and tell you the parameters we look for. So the first one is a biochemical assay. The biochemical assay will try to um, answer two questions. The first one is the analog, it's a substrate for the human enzymes. The second one is analog is uh, inhibitor. And the two type of enzymes we look at DNA polymerases and RNA polymerases. And also depend on the inhibitor we study. For example, if we look at the DNA virus, we'll more focus on this one. Uh, conversely, if we look at RNA polymerase, we'll, we'll more focus on, on this off target because we know actually they have very distinct, or the viral polymerase had this distinct recognition for different substrates. So on the next slide, I'll give you an example that how uh, we study whether compound is a substrate for, in this particular case, is mitochondria RNA polymerase. So on this gel, I, on this slide, I show you, we look at particular compound which shown in the structure, there is two prime C methyl cytidine. And, um, on the right, to the right to it, you can see I have a pre annealed primer template, these RNA primer templates. And uh, the primer is five prime labeled by um, P33. So when I run this product, or when I run this on a gel, you can see uh, the gel shown on the bottom, 
of the slide. Uh, with the arrow, the far left column is my RNA primer. So you can consider that my starting material. And then in the experiment, I'm going to put in a next incoming analog, of, which can be a natural CTP or CTP analog. You see on the right of my primer name will be the CTP result of CTP incorporation. You can see M plus band. So in a sense, if you can see the disappearance of my RNA primer and appearance of a one band right above it, that indicate that the human mitochondrial RNA polymerase will use this uh, CTP as a substrate. And to the right of my CTP uh, lane, you will see four analogs. And in this particular case, all four of these analogs can be used by the mitochondria RNA polymerase. Um, of course, if I'm a drug developer, I won't be very happy, very happy with this result because ideally I don't want human mitochondria RNA polymerase to use this. But also it's a great way to tell me that these compounds I show here have uh, mitochondrial liability. Now I'll move away from biochemical assay to tell you about uh, how do we monitor a general toxicity at the cellular level. Uh, so in this particular one, we look at um, both the cell lines and the primary cells. And this kind of study we often do from 14, uh, five to 14 days because as I mentioned, the mitochondrial toxicity can be seen in chronic treatment. And um, the reason I use both cell lines and primary cells uh, is, is because in the cell lines, they're fast replicating cells. And they are, more, lots of times, they're more sensitive to the mitochondrial toxicity. Actually, FDA guidelines for when you develop this class of compounds, they ask you to use, um, test them in fast replicating cells just to see that. The primary cells, which I do, we have like to get tissue relevance. Uh, you can see I use liver, kidney, blood, and bone marrow. Um, again, uh, when we use different nucleoside prodrugs, due to the cellular enzymes, you may see different degree of activation for different class, different compounds. So that's what we use both uh, primary cells and cell lines. And last, I'd like to move, move, move to the mitochondria focused. From the previous slide, you can see um, what I can measure only the CC50. But the question is whether the compound is a general toxicity, a general toxin, or is mitochondrial toxin, because again, you can tell this comp this when a compound has different properties, we'll treat them differently. So now I look at mitochondria. And the two studies are focused on basically look at mitochondrial protein expression and the mitochondrial respiration, which many of you may have started to look at mitochondrial respiration uh, in your own lab. Let's go to look at the monitoring mitochondrial protein synthesis. So in this one, um, I will treat the cells with compound for a few days, five days, and I'll light the cells in a sense, um, it's basically I get a snapshot of the mitochondrial protein expression at certain, after certain day of treatment. The reason I, I can tell whether compound is specific mitochondrial toxin actually is, is very cool because mitochondria as I've shown here has, um, has its protein come from different sources. One is like COX-1 is um, as shown here, it's encoded by mitochondrial DNA. So the protein is made right there. And, but in mitochondria, um, a majority of the enzyme are not made within mitochondria. Actually the, the protein are encoded by nuclear DNA. So they're made and then transported into mitochondria. So that example is um, succinate dehydrogenase I, uh, A. So by comparing the, the expression level of these two proteins, I can tell you whether a toxin is particular mitochondria a toxin. And as shown on the next slide, um, I showed side by side the, the profile, if I have a general toxin, for in this case, pyromycin, and it's quite different to the one on the right with chloramphenicol. Chloramphenicol is a specific inhibitor of mitochondrial protein synthesis. And the three parameters I monitor here are colored in three different colors. The, the color in dotted red is ATP content, which I monitor, which I measured in this parallel assay um, by cell titer glow. And which colored in blue, that is uh, that's a protein encoded by nuclear DNA. And the green is a uh, mitochondria specific encoded protein COX-1. And you can see for general toxin, everything comes down 
at the same time uh, as a function of increasing drug concentration. But on the right, you can see among the three parameters, the first comes down, it is a mitochondria specific protein expression. So, so I, I think this is as a great to tell us when you typically we measure cell to cellular toxicity by using ATP. But in this case, you can see actually the ATP measurement is not the most sensitive one because way before ATP comes down, the mitochondrial protein already dropped as a result of um, drug treatment. Um, now, how do we use this assay to look at um, nucleoside antiviral? And this particular case, you can focus your attention on the right corner, uh, right bottom corner, you can see uh, the 4 cytidine. That is actually one of the compounds that show you failed clinical phase one trial due to hematologic toxicity. And you can see it's, it's uh, had very similar pattern as the specific chloramidinicol uh, shown on the top. So next, I'd like to move to my one of my favorite um, instrument is monitor something can allow us to monitor live cells look at mitochondrial respiration because mitochondrial function we you know you can have many ways to look at it but really the oxygen consumption real time is a golden standard and in the data i'm going to show you later on really we monitor when i look at when i tell you all oh, the respiration parameter i refer to one parameter that is measured by the mitochondrial stress test um, this particular case, in our particular case, I've written out, I refer to the spare capacity, which difference between the maximal respiration and the spare respiration. Uh, with this, I'd like to share with you the data. So in this particular slide, I share with you, uh, we monitor three parameters at the dose response for, for different class of compounds. The first, what we show in green is DNA content which we measured after a seahorse instrument, all the measurement were done, then we take the plates and lyse the cells and measure the DNA content. And the ATP level is we basically set up a parallel experiment from the seahorse instrument and um, that used cell tactic glow. And the, the blue showing blue is spare respiratory capacity, which is measured by the seahorse instrument I showed you earlier. And in this particular case, I'll show you, we use, three different compounds which has there's unique way to inhibit mitochondria uh, function but they all seem very similar profile right the first one on left is is a chloramphenicol inhibit mitochondrial protein synthesis and in the middle is ddc which inhibit mitochondrial dna synthesis and on the right is fluorocytidine which inhibit mitochondria RNA synthesis is this. And you can see they all follow very similar patterns. Um, the ATP level doesn't, uh, the ATP and DNA level stay quite constant almost to the, I mean, to the end of the high, at the highest concentration of the drug treatment. However, way before that, you will see a decrease of the mitochondrial respiration, in this case, spare respiration capacity. So really, um, seahorse instrument give us a wonderful way to look into the, the world of mitochondrial function and give us a really early indication of whether a compound, regardless of their mechanism of function, the mechanism of action, um, to tell us, pay attention to this compound because it does something to decrease the mitochondrial function. And uh, so before this slide I share with you, we can look at the um, mitochondrial toxin through the mitochondrial protein expression. Now, if I put them side by side, as shown on this slide, uh, on the left is I look at respiration. On the right, I look at the mitochondrial protein synthesis. And I can see they're associated, right? Because I'm testing the same compound. On the left, I see disappearance of mitochondrial respiration as function of treatment. On the right, I see the, the disappearance, um, a lowered expression of the, the protein expression of mitochondria. So, so this is really give a lot of uh, confidence or comfort to saying this all makes sense. Now I share with you our screening paradigm. And with this same exact screening paradigm, I'd like to share with you um, what we have found when we look at um, remdesivir. Remdesivir, for a long time, we know it is um, it is, the anti, it is a nucleoside analog that is active against many, many viruses, as shown on the right. 
you can see um, early on, we know it's, it's active against Ebola, Margaret, Marburg, MERS, SARS. So way before the COVID-19, we know its activity. Um, but it's, it's hard to do clinic trials against MERS or SARS because they come and go. And when you look at this compound on the left, basically you can see that the, 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 it has multiple branches, but the, on the left part of the molecule, which is kind of colored in light orange, these are the, we call the, the prodrug, right? The mass of phosphate functional group. And the, the, the blue functional group you can see on the, to the right of the molecule, that is where the modification introduced to make it uh, really active against um, different viruses in this particular panel. Um, so remdesivir, as you know, it has been proved uh, to treat COVID-19. Um, but next I wanna share with you as researchers in the preclinical branch, uh, how we evaluate the potential liability of this compound, because you can you can sh you can see from the early painful lessons we learned, we are very careful about how we advance or whether we'll advance a nucleus cell analog into clinical trial. So first, I like to go with a pre uh, I'll go with a biochemical evaluation. So the, the the first question, of course, we will ask whether the active metabolite of remdesivir is a substrate and the inhibitor of uh, human DNA RNA polymerases. And on the top table, you can see that we use, look at the DNA polymerase gamma and mitochondrial RNA polymerase, look at their incorporation and represent that the percentage of natural NTP. Um, and the result is actually remdesivir triphosphate is a poor substrate for this host polymerases, which are great news. And the bottom table show you that if I look at inhibition, of multiple DNA and RNA polymerase, in this case, DNA pol alpha, beta, and gamma, and RNA polymerase, pol2, and mitochondria polymerase. And you can see up to 200 micromolar concentration, uh, we see minimal inhibition and indicating uh, remdesivir active metabolite as a weak inhibitor. Now I'll move to the cellular level to look at the general toxicity. So which um, on this table, I show you uh, the CC50 is, again, this is measured by cell type glow, by treating the cells five to 14 days uh, in cell culture. And under the cell column, you can see I have both um, cell lab adapted cells, these are cancer cell lines, also the primary cells. And um, when you move to the right, the compounds I, tested here, not just remdesivir, which are shown under RDV, but also there's a species that is main metabolite for remdesivir. So that is 4.1524. And then I used the CC50 value to calculate the, the selectivity index, basically the antiviral activity used um, to divide the CC50 value and the the conclusions, my, 60, CC50, my selective index is at least more than 170. That gave us comfort um, that this, this compound has a therapeutic window. But knowing this compound, I mean, when you look at remdesivir CC50, you may say, well, these CC50s are not that impressive. They're under, for instance, they're under 10 micromolar. But my question, I want to see if this compound is a general toxin, I will show toxicity, um, and the general nature always particular mitochondria toxicity because when you look at toxicity, it's just also bear in mind the clinical exposure and also treatment time. So all, bear this in mind um, when you look at really whether this toxicity will be shown in clinic. So let's come to the, the maximum study. So this slide I show you, we look at the treated cell to look at the mitochondrial protein expression. And on the right is I put a profile of a, a positive control, the chloramphenicol, what you will see with a specific mitochondrial toxin. And clearly remdesivir and this main metabolite showed minimal mitochondrial specific toxicity in terms of mitochondrial protein expression. Now let's go look at the cellular respiration measured by seahorse instrument. And you can see here, I use two primary cells, the liver and kidney. Again, in this case, um, I didn't see clear separation between these three parameters that indicating that 
remdesivir is not a specific mitochondrial toxin and the liability for, for, for mitochondrial toxicity is low. So with that, I'd like to conclude that hopefully by this time you are convinced that actually nucleoside analogs are cornerstones for antiviral therapy. And over the 40 years, we learned mitochondria is a potential off-target for this class compounds. And you sh we should look at both mitochondrial DNA synthesis and mitochondrial RNA synthesis for different antiviral classes when you target the DNA, right, mitochondria, when you target the um, DNA virus or RNA virus. And also we learned over the years that we should use multiple approaches uh, to evaluate risk mitochondrial toxicity. And um, cellular respiration really has been a wonderful and very powerful tool for us to assessing mitochondrial liability, especially when you do not know the precise off target, but just look at the functional readout, give us really good indication where we should follow up next. And last, I'd like to thank um, all the people helped us along the way. Um, Dr. Beeson, when we, has been such a wonderful mentor, collaborator. When we um, bought our first seahorse, first seahorse instrument eight years ago, uh, we talked to him, invited him to Gilead, and he, and he just has been such a warm and wonderful collaborator to work with. And Dr. Martin Brand and Dr. Um, David Nichols, they are instrumental for us to understand about energetics. Um, if you haven't been to the training, the on bioenergetics at Bach Institute, I highly recommend to you to go. Because I remember the first year we went there, um, so many things went all over my head. But then after working with Seahorse Instrument for a few years, we went back again, and we have such deep, deeper appreciation of their knowledge. And I believe probably I should go back one more time just to take, take full advantage of their training. And Dr. Yvonne Will and Pfizer, I haven't met her in person, but I read all of her publications. I still remember when I first tried to rally support to buy, the, to buy our first seahorse instrument, and I print out all her papers um, and went to our VP and say, look at this, look at what Pfizer had done. And I, I got my instrument. So thank you, Dr. Will. And also like to thank my adjacent seahorse colleagues, because when I look at them, they first come to us as really excellent scientists and wonderful collaborators. And after that, I mean, buying instrument and working with instrument is, is just a natural course. So thank you all for, for helping us along the way. And of course, last but definitely not least, I'd like to thank my colleagues at Gilead Sciences. Uh, Ely, in my mind, is the best horse whisper in the world uh, because all the data you have seen on the seahorse instrument was done by her. And uh, thank you, Ely, for the partnership over the past so many years. With this, um, I welcome questions and comments. Thank you, Joy, for a wonderful presentation. That was very insightful of uh, and to provide us with an, uh, an outline of what you and Yuli do in the lab in terms of toxicity. We will now start the question and answer portion of the webinar. Again, if you have questions you'd like to ask, please type it into the Q&A box. We'll get, try to get through as many questions as we can. And if we don't get a chance to get through your question, we'll look forward to Joy and the Agilent team to follow up after the conference. Now let's get started. Um, so Joy, first question is, ha, um, let me see here. Do you evaluate mitochondrial uh, contra toxicity as a primary screening for toxicity or a more in advanced screening and lead optimization? That's a great question. Um, I'll say if the answer actually two parts. So when we have a nucleoside analog and when we find it is active against virus, so the biochemical assay, actually I'll call that the primary assay but we will not do, and then we'll, we'll do this general CC50, but the 
the mitochondrial function for the seahorse instrument will way too much later on. So the primary acid, the biochemical acid, I'll say primary, but still following after we find the compound is active against a targeted virus. By virus. So not precisely primary, but a close secondary for the biochemical one. But for the mitochondrial part, I think uh, for the seahorse part, we'll wait probably the third step. Thank you. Uh, another question, um, and this is a more specific question, um, for the spare respiratory capacity on slide 33 that you presented, what mm -hmm. was the incubation time of the cells with the drugs, uh, chlorocorphenol, uh, DVC, and the other drugs? That's, does the spare respiratory capacity response happen fast or slow? Um, okay. So slide 33, right? Am I getting that right? Slide 33. Okay. Um, what's a, so the question, what's the treatment time? Yes. Right? What is the incubation okay. time of the cells with the drug? Okay. So all these are uh, three-day treatment. So, so, okay. So actually that's a great question in terms of time because we, we did look at, let me give you an example of DVC. Um, so, for, for this particular compound, we did look at the, the, the signal or the, the phenotype and the function of time. And we found for, for DDC in particular, day one, you, you, won't see, you won't see full decrease of the respiration, but by day five, the, the curves start to merge together. So the sweet spot is day three for DDC and then for, for the for, for azetocytin as well. So we, we said three day treatment is it's good enough. But let me try to remember if for chloramphenicol, have we done a similar time course study? I'll, at this point, I'll say no. So that, that's a answer to the question, the, the portion of the time uh, portion. And what's the other, I think there's another question in that question, just if you can remind me. The, uh, oh, it's just mostly a time course, uh, the data yeah. pre you present in terms of the spare capacity. I guess um, the the uh, user wanted to understand how long you treat it with the drugs. But three days. I think three days is that, the sweet spot. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, another question. Um, you, sh you show that ATP level in some of the slides that you presented doesn't change, but de there's a decrease in spare respiratory capacity. Um, is it due to a compensation through increase in glycolysis due to co cell culture? That's what we believe so too. Actually, we have we, we can see that. I think Evie had data showing that um, increased glycolysis. Yes, precisely. I agree that the cell has a way to compensate for a short period of time. But yeah, I can actually if you can still see my slide, which is slide three D three. It is if I look at this. So this time frame, this snapshot, you're looking at day three. But when I go to day five, everything will come down. So in a sense, the cell cannot go on forever. Uh, so by that time, you will see the ATP line, which in red, will come down as well. Yes. Okay. Um, and, and here's another great question. Has any animal study been done looking at redemptive toxicity? Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes, um, that has been done, definitely. But it's, it's again, it's a, it's a therapeutic tra uh, window. Uh, because when you look at, uh, I, I believe in any anti in any therapy, I think it's really hard to find compounds that absolutely have no toxins at all, but it's really the, 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 the window. And it's also related to the, the treatment duration because, um, right, the pure treatment duration for, for COVID-19 is a five to 10 day treatment. It's we're treating acute virus. So to answer your question, yes, we have seen toxicity in preclinical species, but there's enough window to um, encourage us to move forward. Uh, another question, is there any other possible mechanism by which an antiviral uh, drug, the nucleoside analogs, cause mitochondria dysfunction other than the mitochondria gene expression or mitochondria DNA replication? Excellent question. Yes, I'm so glad you pointed this out because it's true. I mean, my, my, um, mitochondria toxicity the, the, the gene level, the protein level is definitely not the one and only a potential one. 
For example, I'll give you a um, remedy. Ribavirin, that is uh, known to be a mutagen, and also it affects the, the NTP or DNTP pools. So the pools of nucleoside, natural nucleoside, in that sense, it can, it can actually decrease that, and then through that way to affect um, the cellular function. And also for AZT, it's very old uh, HIV antiviral. Um, <laughs> People study this for the longest time, try to see whether it's inhibit mitochondrial DNA polymerase. Actually, it is not. Um, or oh, it's relatively less extent to the fact it, it affect, um, again, mitochondrial uh, affect nucleoside, nucleotide metabolism. Um, so it affect, um, so, so in that sense, it affect mitochondrial function, but not through the ways I described today. So thank you so much for bringing that point. Yes, there are other maximums. It can, um, eventually affect mitochondria, but not through the ones I mentioned. Thank you. Sure. Uh, another question, um, why does different mitotoxin compound show variation in organ or tissue failure, for example, cardiotoxicity versus liver toxicity? And related to this question, do we need to use different tissue-specific cell type for the mitochondria uh, Cicity's tests? That's an excellent question as well. And I've been thinking that for a long time. Um, let me go to, I think, our one of the slides. So, so the, the, the question, yes. I mean, when we look at this, like why? Um, I, it's due to, I, I believe, for, for, for example, why sometimes we see liver and sometimes we will see heart? Um, I, I think it's really due to just PK, uh, pharmacokinetics and accumulation um, of the compound. For, for, for this particular one, I mean, when we look at this one, because the drug, they are, the, the drug I show you at the bottom slide, they are designed to be liver targeting. So I'm not quite surprised when you see liver toxicity because the concentration of this compound is supposed to be high in liver. But in this particular case, why is, you know, why go to heart? Um, I, I guess in in a short way, I say we don't know. But also on the on the alternatively, we can also tell you that um, when people measure the active metabolite in heart, the local concentration is high enough to cause this damage. Um, yes, so that I can tell you. Um, Oh, the other question, whether we look at the leaf, uh, tissue specific uh, cells, we have done that and the result is not very helpful. In a sense, when we treat the cells, we show particular kidney toxicity in kidney cells and compared to other organ derived cells, we, we didn't, that didn't give us really good correlation. Um, so I, I, that's why I feel it's not that straightforward. Uh, that's why I feel the multiple layers of toxicity, uh, uh, the multiple layers of screening helpful. And also, for example, if you come to me and say, Joy, I, you, you, you know this compound, you've shown to your seahorse data, you've shown to about chemical assay, you've shown there is a mitochondrial toxin, then can you predict if we put in human, I hope not, but if we put in human, what kind of toxicity will you see? And I cannot. Uh, that, that, that's a mystery. So I hope uh, probably we can work together to um, advance this as well. But to answer your question, it's very hard to predict which which, tar which tissue will hit. Um, yeah. I totally understand. And um, along those lines, um, have you thought about uh, using, um, you know, there's in terms of the, the stem cell world where um, in 2006, uh, the ability to form more of like human induced polypotent stem cells as a way to mimic more of a particular uh, uh, physiologically relevant model um, to look at, for example, toxicity or cardiotoxicity, uh, liver toxicity as a, a tool that you may use um, to 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 be more specific i think um it, of course it's hard to get specific cells from from um humans or animal but using more like um a human derived um polypotent stem cells i think as a model 
I definitely that I definitely think that the possibility, especially help uh, help us to understand. For example, we went to preclinical animal species and found certain specific tissue related one, and it's great to know that um, as well. And it's good to know ahead of time as well. But the question is how how extensive do you go? But I, I if people have ideas, I welcome. We can collaborate. We can look into this together. Okay. Great. Um, and then one last question uh, before we end. Um, did you compare cellular respiratory results with other mitochondria toxicity assay, like glu uh, glucose and uh, galactose or mitochondria membrane potential? We didn't look at the mitochondria potential one. That's a dye-based assay because I, I felt it's um, it's inferior than the, the seahorse instrument. But actually, we, we, we have done the galactose and glucose um, assay. And uh, so in a sense, in that case, when you, so in theory, I mean, when, when you have galactose adaptive cells, because they cannot go switch to the glucose uh, pathway, so they will be more vulnerable to a mitochondrial toxin. It, it's, it's a great in principle, but when you look at, um, so first of all, as far as I know, I mean, the, 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 the poster child of the mitochondrial toxin, for example, DDC, the, in the early drug discovery, DDC and um, other known mitochondrial toxins have been shown positive in that particular assay. Um, so I would say that assay may work great for other classes compound, for nucleoside, nucleotides. We haven't found a really nice correlation at the predictive as a parameter. Yeah. Okay, thank you again, Joy, for sharing your work with us today. And thank you uh, to our audience for your questions and participation. Now, if you'd like to continue a question and discussion with Joy, join us now in our network lounge by clicking the link to the networking lounge that populates at the close of the webinar.